Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 699 with Kyle Gordon. So with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Kyle Gordon. My man, Kyle, are you feeling unstoppable today? Absolutely unstoppable. Dude, I am feeling unstoppable today. There's kind of a little backstory to you and I, which just sounds a little weird at first, yeah. but we met in Austin like two years ago and you saw you you recommended a restaurant to me I went to that restaurant you happened to be at that restaurant when Crazy. you recommended it wasn't the restaurant you worked at or owned but it, you were a guest I was a guest you recognized me you said hello it was a kind of a surreal moment it was the first time I've ever been recognized in public nice. So thank you for that of course you kind of built my ego up a little bit I appreciate that and then two years later I'm in Dallas Texas I'm interviewing Terry Fom fam I, I always want to say fam but fam. It's i call him I fominator but he's he's like family he said so it's okay yeah so i'm sure he says that a lot of times but it, he calls you out to be a future guest on the show i was like i know kyle <laughs> i was like this is, i was so excited when he called you out uh, but here you are man i'm super excited let me give the uh, listeners an idea of who you are as a student at the university of texas kyle gordon developed a romance with Casa diaz and then in 2006 at the age of 23 kyle decided to pursue his dream to open his own restaurant not just any restaurant a quesadilla restaurant uh he did what i would tell anybody to do he got mentorship or he sought out mentors and then he got employment with a high performing restaurant uh, for kyle that high performing restaurant was raising canes we had a past guest on the show paul uh tunerman who was i think the ceo of raising canes or some kind of director of operations along yeah, those lines business he development. was an executive yeah uh, and it was a great episode i'll be sure to the link to that in the show notes uh, he's with that dog today, but that's another story. Uh, Kyle went on to spend seven years with Raising Canes before leaving to open his dream quesadilla restaurant, Dilla's, in 2013. Today, Dilla's has scaled to four locations with two additional loca locations on the horizon. Man, I cannot wait to dive into your story to find out how you got to where you are today. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Leap and the net will appear. Ooh, leap and the net will appear. Why, why does that resonate with you? It literally is the quote that I left Raising Cane's with. I it, love it's, it. it's what gave me the courage, the strength. Because, like, man, like, fear is the obstacle, yep. ultimately. You mm -hmm. know, like, when, when people are getting into this business or doing their own thing in general. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, like, I'm just going to take the leap, like, and just blind faith that the net will appear. Yeah just jumped you just gotta go i mean it's the hardest part is starting right yeah. the hardest part is getting that nerve to start and then once yeah. you go that that momentum builds right yeah. uh but a great way to get this thing started and um let's dive into your story so it sounds like the the vision for dilla's uh started while you were in college does the romance with quesadillas go back even further though oh yes <laughs> god so as a kid i grew up on chicken fingers and quesadillas literally like nice. so the the restaurant that you referred to earlier, Matt's El Rancho, like we have our name on a plaque at that restaurant on a table. Our name be the Gordon family? The Gordon family. <laughs> and like literally, we, my parents have been going there forever and they have a standing date with like some of their family friends. They go every Wednesday, literally every Wednesday. So I was there every Wednesday, <laughs> every Wednesday. We used to call it El Rank because like we used to get, my brothers and I used to get so tired of it because we went there all the time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where my love affair with quesadillas started. Okay. They would allow me to do my own things. They've got fantastic ones there. Right. And like they're knife and fork, you know what I mean? Like you, you <laughs> yeah. can't pick these things up. They're like really good, fall apart, just ooey gooey <sighs> deliciousness. And, uh, anyway, so like that's where it started. And then kind of as time went by, like I, I got into school and like this fast casual thing was kind of coming out at that time, you know, like this is back. I don't know, 2002, you know, like in that range, 2004, like yep. that time, that window. And I'm like, man, like I love quesadillas. I make quesadillas all the time. Like they're just, it's like the innocuous college dude food. Yeah. Right. And so I'm like, like they should have a restaurant like this. And, you know, I had that idea in college but like it took forever to get to the point yeah. where i could actually make it a reality and just like i, I mean the, the, the cool thing about what you're doing is i feel like it, i don't know if it was instinctual or just happen happenstance where one thing i've learned on the show is to do one thing really well right and I, was that going through your mind at this point or are you just uh, uh, like in love with quesadillas i think that was going through my mind absolutely okay. you know like so focused yeah focused like i knew it was going to be a niche kind of like opportunity because i saw it you know yeah. what i mean i'm like 
dude, these dudes are doing burritos really good. Yeah, right. Or in tacos. These people, are, yeah, you like, know, like, yeah, and like, and I went to like um, an Asian place. You yeah. know, I was like, man, like, they, they're doing Chinese food in a different way, but like, they're just doing these five dishes that are yeah. the most popular Chinese food dishes, but they're just cranking them out. So right. Why aren't quesadillas getting any love? Right. I don't exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And like, still, you know what I mean? Like we're still the only quesadilla restaurant. You know right. what I mean? Like there's a couple food trucks, you know, that you might see, but like, there's not like, man, like for such a big cultural, like Americanized, like even in Mexico and like whatever quesadillas are like a food group. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they're a big deal. And like, they always get, punked by tacos and it's not fair right but i think the the point i'm trying to make is that there was just this huge like opportunity this huge like segment within mexican food mm-hmm. that just hadn't been capitalized and nobody sure. chose to lean into quesadillas yet mm-hmm. and you i don't know if you saw that as an opportunity or if it was just you're in love with quesadillas and you wanted to do it or if it was both yeah um, was it both i think a little bit of both yeah. you know and the other thing is is like i wanted them to be I wanted it to be a twist on it, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, it is a Mexican favorite with, like, an American twist, you know? So, like, all the ones that we have, like, they've got a very distinct variety, you know? Okay. Like, that that was a big piece of it. Yeah, it's, it's focused, but also extremely complex yeah. in, like, the way that we do them. Smoked brisket, not... I'm looking barbacoa at, I'm looking and like at the stuff menu like over your shoulder right now. <laughs> I'll be sure to uh, take a photo of that so yeah. we uh, can can have that playing in the background while you're talking. So yeah. keep going, keep going. Yeah. And so like the the culinary aspect of it for me was like important. You know, like the the type of menu, the different offerings that we would have. Our number one side is french fries. You know what I mean? Like so like I wanted to make it like mainstream. You know what I mean? Mm. Like this like where you could go get like a quesadilla and like it it be a hangout like a hamburger joint would be a hangout. You know what I mean? And like bring the quesadilla off the appetizer yeah. menu and freaking center stage. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I'm not a, uh, I don't really know a lot about quesadillas, like the history of quesadillas, but are there different like variants of quesadillas or is there like a traditional quesadilla? Well, I mean like I, I have or tracked maybe it back. Regional yeah. Quesadillas? And like, honestly, dude, like it comes down to, do you have a grill? Yeah. Right. Like, because it's very simple street food. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, do you have a grill? Do you have some cheese? Throw some toppings in there fold it over and cut that thing. And like, that's a quesadilla. (laughs) Like that's the history. You know what I mean? And like it, it, because of the, it, I don't know when it got like really mainstream adopted onto like the appetizer menu at Chili's and Friday's, you know, you can go get, you can get them anywhere, you know, or a Mexican food restaurant or a Tex-Mex place. Right. But like building on them other than just chicken and cheese has just not really been done. You know what I mean? They're usually pretty simple. The the cool thing about that too, is that there's just like infinite, uh, like, possibilities for like whatever you want to create you can have a lot of fun there yeah right? you can absolutely have a lot of fun. there's a lot of room for fun uh, what were you studying in college i'm curious government okay yes not uh, liberal arts is a better you know because like i was like a history minor government major tried my you know dabbled in economics couldn't pass Do you, you see know any I mean? of that is serving you today i'm curious um honestly dude like i wasn't that great of a student i was like a <laughs> mid 2.0 student you know what i mean yeah, like i i looked at I, I did my business plan half the time i was in class but i couldn't get into business school i had a 1.16 my first semester nice yeah. i like that turn that around i, I like it, it around <laughs> you but, got uh, it up at the end yeah, i definitely had to buckle down after but i mean semester. like it was like i i was a i was a business major in my head and i had the idea and the visions but i but i wasn't smart as smart as the ppa dudes mm. that were in my fraternity you know what i mean like i was like dude like these guys just get numbers <laughs> i don't get numbers but i have something where i could hire them yeah like in my head yeah. right so yeah. liberal arts there you go man <laughs> i love it so you did what i would recommend anybody do mm-hmm. if they want to get involved in the restaurant industry you sought out a, a mentor yeah you found somebody who who has gone through it who could lead you along the way what what did this person tell you yeah so Get First, a job is what he said. Get a little, <laughs> give a little nod to your mentor. We should yeah. acknowledge him. Well, Stuart Owens was my one of my original mentors, right? So when I had the idea and the vision, and he's since passed away. Like, oh. It's a sad story. Um, but he's who got me into the business. You know, he's the one who kind of told me, like, hey, man, like that's a great idea. I think it's cool. It's, it's definitely not investable because you're not investable, mm. right? Like you need to get the experience. If you're going to drive this and like, you can't just, you can't just be like, Oh, I have an idea. Y'all go do it. 
no, like that's not how it works. Like yeah. go see if you have ketchup in your veins. <laughs> and if you do, you know what I mean? Like then yeah. you can, then people will invest in you yeah, I to love power that. this. I love that mentality of go out and become a person of value because it, and it, like ideas, man, there's ideas. Everybody has an idea, yeah. but can the real value is in the person that has the idea and that can execute the idea. Exactly. And that's a great lesson. So he, he said, go get a job. That's yeah. Go get a job, you yeah. know? And like he had a connection at raising canes, you know, that's like, so he was like, yeah, for sure. And at this time, man, like they had, I mean, I was still in school, so they had maybe, maybe 35 restaurants and now they've got 485, wow. you know what I mean? And this is only 2004, yeah. you know, 2005 ish. And so, uh, yeah, man, he's like, dude, I'll get you, like, I'll give them your resume. Like, there's a district manager in Dallas that, like, I'll get you, that's it. That's all I can do for you. I don't know them that well. I'm yeah. like, okay, cool. Like, I'll, I'll try it and, like, but show he it up. He had the eye to be able to recognize a good operation, which I think is oh, really yeah. important. Because you don't just go get a job. Go get a job with the best, is right. what I like to say. Yeah. And I don't know if you knew at this point, but Raising Cane's is what is and was a legitimate operation. Absolutely. Uh, I'll think I mentioned that Paul Tunerman was on the show. He mm -hmm. had, he helped scale Raising Cane's yeah. great culture, great organization. Um, so you, you get, you get to go to work with uh, Raising Cane's take us through that process, that process of getting hired and what they put into you as yeah. a professional. Absolutely. So, and I, sh I share this with the guys and the GMs that I work with now and who I mentor is like, go into an opportunity knowing how you're going to leverage it, mm. not how they're, they're going to leverage you. Right. Mm. And so like, I had a plan going in, in terms of like, I know I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to like be a career dude here, but like, I'm going to put in great time and I'm going to give more value than I get out. But first day, like I show up in a gold tie, right? Like full suit, you know, like, and I'm like, Cause I'm straight out of college, wet behind the ears. This is <laughs> yeah. how you show up to an interview. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like the district manager, his name's Ben. He's awesome dude. And like he rolls from the back of house with grease on his knees, the fryers <laughs> down. You know what I mean? He's like, Hey man, like what's up? Like, let's talk, you know? Like, and like, he looks at you and goes, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, you look like a good dude. You're in. Right. <laughs> and so it, it kind of was like that, you know, like, because not a lot of you know, graduates from the University of Texas roll in and say, I'll take $12 an hour. Yeah. Right. And so like, he was like, dude, like we'll make you a service manager. Like, are you in the right place? Yeah. Like, there's a corporate <laughs> yeah, there's right a, Yeah. If you street. go over here, yeah. you can definitely get a way better job than this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, but like, that's what I wanted to do. Right. I knew that I needed that as a stepping stone to get to my ultimate goal of restaurant ownership. Mm. And so like at the time, you know, like there was different opportunities also at Raising Cane's. Like they had some, they had some programs that like you could own your own kind. Like yeah. you could be like a pillar program Tons partner. Of opportunity. And, right. So I was like, man, like I'm all in on that, you know, cause they appreciate like they have an entrepreneurial spirit. It's small enough, you know, like I don't think I would have made it if I would have gone into McDonald's or like a, some giant chain where it's like, okay, like here's the exact path. Like you do these things, check these boxes. No, it was like more, creative yeah. i used to create like systems and stuff and send them in and we would roll them out to the district like yeah that was fun you, you know? know so i think the lesson here is you know don't just go to work for any organization go to work for the best and ideally an organization organization that's scaling because that's where you're going to find the most like that's where you're going to be able to fast track your oh, own yeah. career absolutely uh, and create opportunity for yourself and if you're wondering where do i go to find those places we'll just keep on listening to restaurant unstoppable yes i'll find them for you <laughs> always absolutely looking to hire, so keep going yeah and so um you know that that opportunity turned into i got hired as a service manager or shift manager, um, four months went by in, in the restaurant business. What I love is, is people filter themselves out. Yeah. So like pretty quickly, a GM opportunity opened up. I was like, the turn's so high. There's always going to be an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. You know? And so I was like, man, like I'm just going to set myself apart and be the obvious choice. And like four months goes by, I'm the obvious choice. Right. And then like, so I get promoted to general manager within four months, which is insane because I didn't crazy. know what I was doing, you know. <laughs> um, and then but they must have saw something in you. They, I yeah. think they, they saw the. I think they saw the hunger. Yeah, you know the desire. Yeah, to, to learn that you yeah. wanted it, and, and maybe a and a pulse. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I think and so like, yes, I was the obvious choice. I was hungry. Um, I was recommended by my general manager, which yep. was really important. That she helps. was like, "Hey, he can do it, and I'll make sure that he's successful." He'll, he can leverage me. And at the time, you got to remember, there was only two canes here and they weren't doing that well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and most of their company was in Louisiana, right? And yep. so we were kind of on an island. So like, we had to like, 
hustle and like do a lot of things on our own over here, as I would call it. And so, um, man, fast forward, like I open, you know, I'm at in the one in Louisville running that, doing the best I can, taking advantage of when they did visit, you know, like, cause I would get a visit maybe once every other month or something. And so like when they came, I need to be on point. Yeah. So like we ran on point and tried to stand out, you know? And so all those things led to me being a training restaurant, um, opened a new restaurant, which is in the same parking lot as we are in this, in this Dilla's and, uh, opened that one from brand new, um, became a certified training managing partner. There was only three out of a hundred restaurants, you know, like when I left. So yeah. like, man, I took it to the tip you know what i mean like i was like i'm gonna be the best there is here nice. because like i need to be able to leverage this opportunity and like be the obvious choice for when i go ask somebody for money right yeah. like so i'm like hey i wasn't just the gm at raising canes i was literally yeah. the tip of the spear Dude, you're best writing there your story right now and like the, your mentor told you you have a great idea but you're not investable. Your right. idea might be investable, but you're not investable. So go make yourself investable. You had this in the back of your mind yeah. saying, I need to tell a story. I need to become a person of value. Yeah. Right? I can't remember who said that. Who said, don't become a person of, of success, become a person of value. Yeah. Something. I mean, there's somebody who said that. I yeah. I'm, he's not around anymore, but it was yeah. some famous dead dude. It's a good <laughs> quote. And it that's is. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so like, you know, that's the, uh, that was the, the growth. You know, like I learned how to do it. I went through, I was running once at one point I was running with two managers, me and another guy. Wow. That's it. Open, close, close, open, close, 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 open, 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 close, close, close. Right. And so it's like, you got to figure out, you figure out fast if you're, if you're worthy of the grind. I think that's another big reason why it's so important to get experience in the industry. Cause like we glam, we glorify it. We glamorize it. Right. Yeah. The reality of the situation is it's, 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 you can have a lot of fun, yeah, but you're going to work your ass off. Yeah, it's hard process. work. Yeah, and you got to love it to yeah. continue to show up. So what is it that you love about it? I mean, you didn't know that you loved it before this point, the, but you, you happen to love it, Yeah, which is a good thing, but what yeah. exactly it is that, that you love? The people, you know, like, and people. it's very, that's very kind of like a simple way to put it, you know, but like the people are the, are the challenge, mm. right? Like it's the stretch, yeah. you know, it's the... It's the constant, like, how can I influence this young man, young woman? How do I make them better? Mm. How do I, you know, inspire them? How do I lead by example? Like, how do I tell them, you know, to put their hat on straight? You know what I mean? And make Don't it curl your brim. Right. Like, I make it, make <laughs> it mean something to them. Right. Yeah. And like sell the vision. And like, so all of that stuff is a, uh, is a, it's a never ending masterclass in like human psychology. Right. And mm. that jacks me up. Like I can have conversations. Like I had two, two hour long conversations yesterday and I feel felt more energized and alive after that than, than anything. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I get, I get jacked up off of like one-on-ones yeah. and like development. I and I know there's this quote saying, like somebody said it and I'm, I'm not really great at identifying who said these quotes, but it's coming <laughs> into my head right now um, that, you know, we can change the world mm -hmm. in this industry. Yeah. Um, most people that, that, you know, hear that go, okay, Mr. You know, yeah. whatever, like you, sure you can change the world. But the yeah. truth is we can, because we have the, inf we have the ability to influence and, and really give young people like, knowledge skills yep. values uh perspective yep. right and if we can change these young people if we can make their days better and make them better mm -hmm. then we can change the world it's such yeah. a powerful industry because of that and yeah. I, I love that you recognize that yeah man. that's great I mean, we're in an eye contact epidemic right now <laughs> right? <laughs> right and so like we're training people on eye contact yeah. right you know what i mean like that's, that's a weird thing more hard <laughs> <laughs> uh so like it's an interesting yeah. thing though and like you have to teach work ethic mm -hmm. right like there's these things that are like you know, it, it's sad to see the erosion of the young workforce right now, you know, because they're focused on extracurriculars or whatever to try to get into college. But like they're missing out on why so many young people start in the restaurant business. Yeah. It's, it's not for the extra 12 bucks. Yeah. It's for the, you know, like those those non tangible life skills, those soft skills where it's like, can you carry on a 30 second conversation? Can you make eye contact for more than one <laughs> second? Right. Like are you willing to understand that the hard work is involved in life? Yeah. Right. And that's the one thing that, and, and I think I brought this up a bunch of times in the, the recent episodes that it's something that's been on my mind is that there seems to be this aversion towards hard work Yeah, that like everyone's trying to work on their business and not in their business. Mm -hmm. And there's truth to that, that yeah. if you want to scale, you got to work on your business and not in your business, mm -hmm. but you also have to love working in your business. Yes. And, 
people try to bypass that entire step mm -hmm. just to go to working straight to on their business. And it's like, love it, get in there, be a part of it because yeah. that's what it's all about. And I just, it's, it's so important that we remind people of that. Yeah. Um, so dive into some key mentors mm -hmm. that you've had at Raising Cane's people that really stood out and imprinted on you. What do they teach you? Yeah. I think that, um, accountability was a big one. You know what I mean? Like it's a, a kind of, it's okay to be the boss, right? That's a book, but like, it's also like kind of a tagline that I had to learn early on. Like yeah. you don't have to be the cool one, right? Like you got to be like tough on standards, easy on people. Right. And I had to learn from mentors like T Tommy Van Wolf is still at Kane's like awesome dude. Right. Like, and just like fun, but stern. Right. And like great at communication, knew how to talk to people in the community. Right. Like marketing was, I, I was so high on excellence in terms of the operation that I lost sight of who I was doing it for while I was there a little mm. bit. And like, I don't remember like, man, I need to get outside the four walls. Yeah. You know, are like, you doing it for? yeah. Right. Like who am I like the customer? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. and so like, do I know the principals at the high school? Like, am I really helping them? Am I helping them achieve their goals? Am I, am I talking to the right PTA people? Right? Like I, I'm grinding away, making sure that I'm getting 99% cleaning audits. Right. And, but like, I'm losing sight of like, man, I'm doing this for the customer. I need, to, I had to get outside the four walls. I had to learn that skill. Mm. Right. And that's one of those things that I learned through him. But like most of my mentors, like honestly, that came after the fact because that time at Canes, everything was a management mentor, right? Like everything was like a people process mentorship, right? Like Keto Cody was a COO. And I was also very lucky. I trained 60 general managers because they went through this explosive Damn. growth. Yeah. And I was the training restaurant in DFW where their home office was. And their home office is a mile and a half down the road. So I trained the CFO. I trained, the, I trained everybody. So I got like, I was on mentor supercharge, man. Like I had like people were quitting all these other concepts coming to Canes and being like, here's why it sucks there. Here's what's awesome there. Uh, like man. one thing I'm really curious about, and you mentioned it earlier, you said don't be hard on people, be hard on systems and easy on people. Mm -hmm. Dive into that. Cause I yeah. feel like that's a really great lesson. What do you mean by that? Tough on standards, right? So like, Hey man, like I love you. Uh, you're a great person, but one of our standards is, is wearing a belt to work, yeah. right? And being on time, yeah. you know? And what I try to communicate is like that we're in a contract together, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a very loose kind of contract, but it's an exchange, right? Our company's yeah. money for your time yeah. and effort, right? And so like I, I, you agree to abide by a certain set of standards, right? I'm gonna be really strict on those, right? But if you're hitting those, you're going to have the most fun here that you've ever had. Yeah. Right. So like that's part of that philosophy. Well, I think it's really important just that that mentality is so powerful because I think sometimes we will, will get really, we'll beat up people, mm -hmm. you know, if, the, if they're missing the standards and they, they might take it personally or they mm -hmm. might, we, we never want to put the energy on them that negative right. energy on them. We put the negative energy on the standard, right? Yeah. Maybe, well, not, I'm, I hope I'm communicating that well, but the idea is like if people pick up, and they think that you don't like them, mm -hmm. that they're going to resent you. But if you just have right. to make it about the standards right. and say, we all have to meet these standards. It's not you. It's the standard. Yeah. That, and I think what happens when you do that? What happens? It builds teamwork. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, it, it makes it an easier place to work. And like a lot of the feedback and like, again, like, man, like I've been, I've been in this industry for 15 plus years. So like I've seen it all. I've seen why people quit, why people stay, why they quit managers, bad management, all that type of good stuff. And it usually comes down to like, they they're not fair mm. right you know what i mean like so part it's of being a, a fair issue usually it's nine times out of ten. Yeah. yeah you know and like if you're just fair like i hold everybody to the same standard like i don't let i'm not easy on standards with, with him i'm easy on people always and i'm always strict on standards yeah that's it. But like, it's gotta be the, the consistency of the delivery of yeah. that message. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about people up to this point, mm -hmm. um, with your experience over at Canes, mm -hmm. uh, raising Canes. Uh, what about operations and business and mm -hmm. things of that nature? Uh, they were opening a ton of restaurants. Maybe they taught you a thing or two about how to scale, mm -hmm. uh, get into some of the, the, the business things that they taught you beyond mm -hmm. culture system. So, um, the system is very focused, right? And so, I, I saw some opportunities in that when I adapted kind of my own restaurant um, because we are focused, but we kind of have a, a wider lens in terms of like who we cater you said towards. The systems focus. What do you mean by the system? Um, 
it's a focus menu, right? So okay. like it all goes in one direction, right? Like it, you know, it's, it's a, it, it produces one thing and that's chicken finger meals. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. And so like very simple, easy overall operations, which is an amazing business system because you, you cater towards the lowest common denominator, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link, like all of that stuff, right? That's how you build a restaurant system that works, especially if you're going to scale. Right. And so I learned that I, I learned that I needed systems, processes, and procedures that were lowest common denominator. I don't have anything that's too complicated. I don't have anything that's too chef driven, right? Yeah. It's something that I can teach a 16 year old in about an hour. It's easier to teach one person to do one thing really well than it is to teach one person to do a bunch of things really well. Right. You, you're channeling the energy. You're putting yeah. all the focus into this one thing and mastering this one thing. And if you can be number one at something, you're like the difference between being number one and number two is like half right like double like it's a huge difference mm. so channel all of that energy into being the best at something yeah um and then build systems around being the best at that one thing is what i'm hearing from yeah you. and it's it's you know very station based you know what i mean like you learn one thing at a time like uh, like here you need to learn cheese right and then now that you know cheese like you need to learn grill so and you're now breaking all that the 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 components of the process into a station yes. and you, tr you get them to master that one thing at a time. Right. Why is that so powerful? Well, what, what, why is that the best approach? Well, it's, it's, it's wading into the water, right? Like we would never put somebody on build them. You have to know the entire menu. You have to know all the product specs. You need to know all like what quality looks like to us, right? Like you need to know how to plate, right? Present and portion, right? But on cheese, you need to know how to put a tortilla down, put cheese on it and communicate like let's teach you that first mm. right and so like you wade them into the water man and then you get you build this beast who's a build beast ninja you know what i mean <laughs> like but they don't make it there and for six you know six days at least you know to get onto that position yeah and so like wading them into the water and like ramping them up same thing like with front of house like you don't take orders on day one you work expo so you can learn what the orders should look like right yeah. like that's what I mean by like like station based, but it kind of builds up into yep. the more complicated stations. What else, um, man? Like I think that we flow cook quesadillas. That's that's like our proven process, right? And so like when you look into business, you're like, man, like what's the proven process that makes them run? You know what I mean? And like our proven process is is we flow cook quesadillas. We only have one size, right? Yeah. Like and so like we know that we can properly execute a long line of people in a very reasonable amount of time, mm -hmm. right? And so like, that's another lesson that I learned there is like, you better be able to flow cook, like to be able to knock down a line if you wanna serve masses of people. Yeah, so right? again, like using the uh, chicken finger as an mm -hmm. example, they do chicken fingers really well and they mm -hmm. might have like, I don't know, 10 different meals. Like what, I don't know the Raisin Cane many Four times. meals. Four meals. Yeah. So all those meals have chicken fingers in them so mm -hmm. you can batch cook a, a you know a, a basket full of exactly. chicken fingers and you're gonna crush 10 uh, orders in that one fry. Correct. So same concept. With same concept. Yeah. Um, so you're thinking about that. You, you must have not known this stuff when you had your Dilla's idea, though. I mean, it's no. Kind of, oh, gosh. You're kind of fortunate in the sense that you're able to, to oh, execute yeah. in this one. Oh, fashion, yeah. Right? Like when I designed Dilla's in college, it was a Chipotle style, like walkthrough, like, okay. right? And I think that you still could kind of execute it that way. Build your own? Yeah, like bit, like go along the thing and I'm going to grill it here and kind of like there would be some, some creative way to build that and design that kitchen. But like, I mean, dude, like we have like, you know, when you're doing $1,500 hours, like you got drive through case it is, dining case it is, order online case it is, you know, you got a catering mega Dilla, like you better like, have a pretty darn slick system for like cooking a lot of them. Yeah, right. I feel that. And you got to be able to, if you're going to have a business like this, you have to have a level of anticipate to order. Right. And so like when 10 people walk in, we have 10 shells that go down, put cheese on them, start getting the right toast point, the right melt point. Right. And like, we can just about guarantee that at least nine of those are going to sell. Mm -hmm. And that last one, we just need a, another person to walk in behind them, right? Yeah, you know, so right like, yeah, so, yeah, or lunch, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I'm loving this conversation, but I want to start moving the, the conversation forward to yeah. you breaking off to, to open Dillas. Yeah. So when did you know you were ready? Um, Actually, don't answer that question yet. We're going to take one quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to find out when you were ready. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again.
We're back, and I asked you, when did you know you were ready to leave Raising Cane's to go pursue your dream, which is Dilla's? Um, I knew I was ready because I had taken it as high as I could at, at the single unit level, and the opportunity beyond that would have taken me in a, in a whole different direction and a whole different path, more of a career path, I think. And yeah. so like, I was like, man, like if I'm going to run one restaurant really great, I might as well run my own restaurant really great. Yeah. And so that's when I was like, I'm ready to run a single unit really great. And yeah. so that's when I was like, okay, cool. Like time to go. Isn't there a part of you now that you're at four locations with six on the horizon mm -hmm. that kind of wonders what it would have been like to go open, um, raising canes throughout the nation to get that experience of opening opening and like to learn a little bit more about site selection and anything along those lines yeah but i think i wasn't willing to to be that patient you know yeah. what i mean like because no matter when you start most people at least like you have a three mile marathon to being sustainable being able to grow etc right and so like if i would have waited two more years, the additional knowledge would have set me back on my start of three years. Right. And so like, I wasn't willing to do that. You know, I think that I had an, an opportunity to start it, you know, and get going. And like, I'll learn that stuff yeah. along the way. You know, the truth of the matter is more mentors, like, like all that stuff, like you can hire people to come on and help you scale. Right. There, there are people who specialize in that. Right. But at the end of the day, none of that opportunity will come unless you can run one store yep. really well. Right. You know, so you, you, you're, I think you're right in identifying that. Yeah. Um, what does running one store really well look like? Paint that picture. Like give us an aiming point of what that looks like. Well, Ooh, man, it, it's tough. I could tell you what it looks like really well right now, right? When everything's built out, ready to rock and roll. Like if you bought a franchise, like if you bought a franchise in a box. Um, but what it looked like then was me being the general manager, right? I hired service managers around me. I was also doing all the construction, right? And so like managing all of that stuff got open and it was just about listening to the customer feedback, right? And delivering on what we promised that we were going to do, which was primo quesadilla meals. So that's just what we did. We just made sure that everything that went out was accurate, consistent, what we promised to the people that were coming in. And like our goal was to reward, and it still is, reward curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Because like people would be buying like, what the, like, what is that place? You know, like, well, you have to reward the curiosity if you want to build sales, okay. right? And so we were constantly trying to reward curiosity in the early early days of like, man, this place is good. I am going to tell somebody about this. Like, they need more support. So how do you reward curiosity? Break that into like a step-by-step -step process. Yeah, like it starts with like with, with the basics of running an amazing restaurant, right? So like the customer service, right? Like a, a clean window when somebody walks up to your storefront, right? The experience starts when they pull in the lot. So it's got to be a clean parking lot. You yeah. know what I mean? Like all those things are these micro influences. So the, the first step is making sure that the experience itself is rewarding. Right. All the things you're supposed to do as a, a primo uh, operation. Yeah. Do all those things like, yeah. like what you just listed. What's yeah. next? Um, execute the food. Right. And so like you got to make sure that like th they like the food, you know, that that's good. You have a good product offering. Right. And like in that first year, like, man, like we had all sorts of crap that we had no business selling. Like we opened without a bunch of stuff as well. Like we we didn't have chips. We didn't have queso. Like so our customers were like, dude, I'm not coming back here if you don't have chips and queso. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like and we're like, OK, like that makes sense. You know, yes, like yeah. so those we probably tweaked and, you know, messed with and adapted and changed the menu for the first three years. Okay. Right. Like, I mean, it was like constantly changing. We went from an eight inch quesadilla to a 10 inch quesadilla, like for plate appearance and for size and portioning and all this stuff. And like, um, you know, like we just listened really well, you know, and really made sure that we executed on what the customers were asking for. So for do this the basics of well, do the food well, listen well. And yeah. that was going to be a separate question I was going to ask you, but mm -hmm. you might as well sew that into this. Yeah. What What were you doing to listen well? What did you have systems around mm -hmm. listening? Did you were you leveraging technology to listen? Like, what were you doing to listen well? Well, I was here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I was here yeah. seventy hours a week. You know, so I'm is like this the original location. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. This is this is the baby. So. Um, you know, I was in the lobby, you know, like I, we would take 
feedback, you know, and like pretty early on, we built a pretty good diehard, like we call them Dilla's diehards, but like we built a pretty good community pretty quickly. Right. So like we got emails from them. So like now we've got like 30,000 emails or something like that. But like back then, I don't know, maybe we had 2000, something like that. But like we would get like a thousand responses when we would send something out and be like, what do y'all think about this? Should we, we're going to get rid of the oinker. What's y'all's reaction to that? Like, Facebook was out at the time. So like we were able to talk to people pretty easily on Facebook and yeah, maybe we only got 20 data points because we had like seven followers. Right. Yeah, but like, but at this point you're not just listening. Yeah. You're, you're letting them be a part of the process. Right. You're letting them take a sense of ownership over right. the brand because yeah. now they're influencing it. Now exactly. it's their baby too. Exactly. Right. That's powerful. Why is that so powerful? Well, I mean like you got to build a tribe, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we all know that, you know, like part of building a tribe is like making sure that the people are going to be the end users of your product, like feel good about it. You know what I mean? And like, that's why like we're committed to community impact. You know what I mean? Like, and not, I don't know, dude, like you want to be the community restaurant, Mm -hmm. not just a restaurant in the community. You know what I mean? And like people gravitate towards that. And I think that people getting into the restaurant business lose, lose sight of the fact that like restaurants started as like little local shops right. you know like we're oh oh crap janie and johnny are gonna make some food tonight you know what i mean like let's go pay them so we don't have to make it for ourselves I dig it. Yeah, you yeah. know so we're, we're i love what you're giving us we're getting yeah. some really great advice right now uh, around listening around uh get, like like rewarding people for for choosing us uh one thing we didn't get into is how did you actually execute opening a restaurant did you yeah. have your own capital were you putting money away did you have to borrow like what, what was what did that process look like yeah so i knew that was coming you know what i mean in terms of that that time frame um it also kind of aligned with why i was when i was ready to leave is because i thought i could get the capital right like previous to that i didn't think so you know i'd been doing the numbers on it so friends and family were family-owned business right and so when we when i left raising canes I, I was a managing partner program. So like I had stocked away some cash myself. Okay. Um, and like they have like this kind of like yearly bonus thing that kind of goes along with being a managing partner. Yeah. And so I, I got that and I think that was like 10 or $15,000. Yeah. You yeah. know, something like that where it was like, okay, like my investors are going to give me some money. We, it was 200 something thousand dollars to like get open and, and running. And it's then low. Yeah, pretty low, but like this was a second gen restaurant. Well, that's another thing I was gonna yeah. bring. Up. Was this a McDonald's or I mean, it was Jack in the Box? Jack in the Box. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So Left behind some stuff. Like yep. you know, the the construction was pretty expensive. I mean, not pretty expensive. Like, but we got into it bootstrap, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, we didn't buy a bunch of used equipment. Like, we spent money on it. Like, we wanted it to last. You know, we we we're on a five year sublease, so like it was like, hey thing goes downhill we're only in this five years you know what i mean like it's not going to be the end of the world you know so like we looked at the risk you know i secretly love that you guys took over a jack-in-the-box because i I have like this vision this dream for the restaurant industry of like the the big dogs of the world kind of being fragmented yeah and like local communities taking over their like local markets and yeah. just move, like thank you all the big spenders the mcdonald's the yep. jack and box of the world for for building all these yeah. locations now we can just move right in it's right? already happening the man. shells are here like it's yeah. like a like a like a i don't know a snail moving or like whatever yeah. kind of creature moving into a new shell second right? gen is great yeah, dude. It's, it's turnkey it's, it's yeah. a way to keep it cheap so for sure um i mean that's one thing they're doing to give back to the next generation of operators yeah. i really like yeah uh, those big guys so anyway keep going yeah and so like the, and then so we raised that money um, through friends and family and like the the equity partners in our company is me my wife maggie's parents and her uncle kevin nice. right and so like that's it like that's the core that's the only investors that we have right now I mean, you're very fortunate to be able to have that be your situation Not absolutely everybody has that option but yeah. what are the benefits of keeping it close and tight like that man um Freedom, flexibility, um, patience, understanding, you know, like they're not investing in the business. They're investing in you. At right. This point, yeah. Right? Like they're, they're betting on the jockey. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, and they're like, man, like we think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they had some restaurant and some hospitality kind of background in their family, you know? And so they, they got it. You know what I mean? Like they're like, man, like this could work. And now Kyle is capable of yeah. deploying became this money. Man of value. Right. Yeah. I became the man of value. And so I'm like, we can do it, you know? And like, here's what it looks like if we do it. Now then, I will say that it was a long, hard road. So like that first, dude, that first year, man, like we were, we opened like in the middle of ice Maged and there was like a, a giant ice storm in 2014, <laughs> the early part, like roads were closed. Yeah. We were closed. Like we were doing like, 
eight grand a week, like dying, dude. Like, oh. and we needed like 15 to break even. Yeah. Right. And so I'm like, dude, this is not looking good. And, uh, it was, I thought we were going to open like 40, you know what I mean? I'm like, Oh, every restaurant does 40 yeah. grand a week. Uh, and so they, they don't. So just everybody out there, they don't. Um, yeah. and then like, it, it's like, it's like getting in a giant locomotive, right? And you have the only thing that powers it is cash. And there's an ice storm. Yes. And there's an ice storm <laughs> and I'm shoveling cash yeah. into the, the boiler, right? Yeah. And just feeding this thing, dude. And it's moving at one inch yeah. per hour, right? Okay. And that's what it was like that first year was like it burning slow, cash and it, moving slow. But you're you're building momentum and it's getting faster and faster. Yeah. As long as you keep on leaning into it, yeah. you know, it might not be accelerating like a rocket, yeah. but it's going to be moving faster and it's going to get easier and it's going to get easier. Yeah. And uh, it's important to, the, to point that out. But what were your biggest challenges early on? Like what, reflecting back on those that first year, yeah. uh, your biggest challenges and maybe your biggest failures. Yeah. I think that the big challenges were... Or, um, not understanding my food costs, not being a sophisticated business person. You mentioned earlier money wasn't your thing. Yeah. It, or it, the it, numbers weren't your thing. Yeah, not not really. You know what I mean? Like I way under food costed. You I'm know. right there with you, man. I'm horrible with numbers. It's yeah. my biggest Achilles heel, probably. I, 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 sh- I, I was like under the interpretation, you know, like I was like, man, like if we... Let, let's kind of like make sure that we create this tribe, you know, and like we'll almost give it away to build the base and then we'll start getting in the costing and stuff like that once we have a base built and some fans, right? So like let's drive top line sales and not worry as much about the meat and the P&L, right? Yeah. Like it, it, it's okay. You know what I mean? Like we'll get there. Focus is on lo- volume. Focus on the volume. Yeah. Focus on the product. Focus on all those other things um, that are so important. And I also... I used a lot of time in those, you know, early days, des- and, and I don't think I would do it any different, designing systems, mm. right? Like, dude, like I, you, if you looked into the back end of my company, you'd be like, this is a hundred million dollar company. How many restaurants do they have? Three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause like I just, I, I geeked out on like this, like we need to be able to duplicate this, scale this. I need to be able to get out of this restaurant. It's that mentality of treating your small business like a big business. Right. And if you can get all those things in place mm-hmm. and, and get it nailed down with one, then it makes it makes that trying to make your small business into a big business later much easier. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Uh, so what were what were some of the systems that you you implemented that had the biggest impact on your operation? early on training development for the team members okay. right like was a was a really big like developing those station well, training that's what guys you did too. yeah when you were with raising cane like that was your job to bring yeah. on managers and train them absolutely so this must have came really naturally to you oh yeah so what but, is it, what's a good training program look like man like we we developed phase training you know what i mean like kind of like back to what i was talking to you about like we wanted to make sure that people understood like the basics of hospitality the basics of leadership what is phase training um like, so we have three phases, right? And so like, for instance, like you might, you might learn about soft skills first, and then you might learn about how to keep a restaurant safe, right? And secure and like kind of the um, safety systems, the protocols, right? And then third, you might l- learn about the P&L, how the nuts and bolts of the operation, how to run r- the r- labor the right way without sacrificing customer experience. Like yep. that's like a phase Did you training. open book management here? Um, in terms of like the financials, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So like, uh, we review the P and L every every month. Like, dude, but like, man, like those first couple of years, like we might have a P and L come out two months afterwards. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. dude, like there's so many transactions in a restaurant, and like even now, like now we have mid month P and Ls, which is freaking like driving the Starship Enterprise compared <laughs> to like <laughs> a Pinto, which is what we were driving year yeah. year one, year two, year three. You know what I mean? Because like. There's so many things to focus on. Like there's so many industries and like uh, departments that that are required for a restaurant organization. Okay. You know, it's nice. crazy. Anything else? I think the the question I asked was uh, like, what does that training look like? You said phase training, and mm-hmm. I kind of I think that's where we kind of left off. Uh, yeah. So what what are the different phases? Highlight those again for me that you would have. So like, uh, again, like I'm kind of stumbling through this, but like in terms of management onboarding them to learn the basics of the operations, the kind of operational things, operational checklist, stuff like that. Okay. Then it's like the safety and security of the customers and of the team. Okay. And then lastly, it's the more sophisticated stuff that's like, 
labor, like labor modeling, uh, you know, how the reducing waste, how everything affects the P&L. So what's the time items. scale look like from phase one to phase three? Like eight weeks. Eight weeks? Okay. Yeah. So eight week management training is what we do. That also includes two weeks of team training. And how are you tracking where each individual is at, at this phase, through, going through these different phases of Workbook. Training? So okay. like it's a workbook, you know, like, so you have a workbook, just like if you took Spanish 101 in college, you know what I mean? Like you have a workbook that kind of takes you through learning the language, right? And so like you also have that and you have your textbook. So yeah. it's the same thing. We have a workbook that keeps you on track day to day to make sure that you're hitting the milestones in your textbook. That's basically how gotcha, it works. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Anything but like, dude, like that stuff, like it drains the living crap oh, yeah. out of me like dude <laughs> sitting in front of a computer and grinding a training you, manual oh but you're dude. talking to the guy that literally rather drive across the country to sit across from somebody and stare <laughs> on the screen so i totally i totally understand where yeah. you're coming from there um okay what else did you go through that first year that was mm -hmm. a struggle that's worth bringing to the surface or you haven't touched on a failure yet i think there's a lot we can learn from failures or maybe you're just so good there were no failures no right? man like th there were <laughs> certainly failures and yeah. like i, I think Losing money, you know, like makes you feel like a failure. Um, a, I think that uh, losing sight of like kind of the top line sales and, and instead of instead of building that quicker and looking more at the PL, I would I would I wouldn't say waste time, but I would invest my time building these training systems that I'm talking to you about. You know, so it's kind of a double edged sword of like it it, it being I wouldn't required. say you're losing money, I would say you were buying time. You know yeah. I mean? you're buying yeah, you had a, you, the thing is you have to be everywhere in the early days. Right. So like you can't. It's not unreasonable to think that one area of your business might suffer, so you can pick up another area. Of yeah. Business. But when you but the energy that you put into creating your onboarding and your culture and all that stuff, I'm sure uh, allowed you to be able to it probably bought you time. Yeah. So you could go focus on the other areas because now you're empowering your people. You're right. giving them the tools they need to be successful. Yeah. And if they can't be successful, then you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they're going to pull that out of you and then you won't have time to go work on the things you need to work on. Yeah. I don't know if I lost my listeners or you in that, that uh, ramble, yeah. but <laughs> man, like there, that first year, like there's yes. I, in hindsight, a lot of it made sense and makes sense now, but like there was a lot of like, you know, wasted time and energy on stuff like I, And it's harder, like really point out a failure because like, we had menu item failures. Like we had a chickadilla, which is like a chicken salad quesadilla. It was a freaking nightmare. Like <laughs> <laughs> if you ever open your own quesadilla place, don't open with a chicken salad, Sounds cold messy. chicken. Oh God, dude. <laughs> um, so there was stuff like that that were but failures, think, but people like, failures. You know, I hired a bunch of man, you know, I caught, you know, a guy smoking pot out back. You know what I mean? Like there's, and you're like, dude, like I thought, wh what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like there's those, and you, you just can't wait until you get home. Oh my God. <laughs> and like, you would like, I would allow my things to drag, allow things to go on at, at, to save my own time, right? That I wouldn't have allowed in a previous life when I had more of a support system on the people side of the yeah. business. Like you right? want to fire this person, but you can't. I need them to open tomorrow. But yeah, because you, you got a wedding to go to or like whatever it exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. You hit the nail yeah. on the head there, Really? Dude. Is that really what it was? Yeah, like all sorts <laughs> of stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where yeah. I'm like, I still want some semblance of a life, yeah. but like year one and two, like it was ripe with that type of like, Dude, this guy is not my guy. Like he's not doing me any favors, but I'm I'm holding on to him. I'm giving him two, three, four chances, like because he'll come in and close on the days that I, I can't do What's it. What's the result of that? Of keeping the person around that shouldn't be around? What what how does that hurt your business? It it it's like an infection. You know what I mean? Like that they they kind of reach their tentacles in and like your standards start to slip a little bit. All of a sudden like they didn't wipe out that third pan the way that they should have. Like they didn't they didn't organize the rack the way it should be. You know what I mean? And like all of a sudden like those small yeah. details start to add up yeah. and like it, it, it will erode the culture. Your culture isn't what you say it is, it is what you are. Right. <laughs> it's what's yeah. happening right now. Yeah. That is your culture. Not Absolutely. Like, your, your book might say something, <laughs> but if what's happening is a different thing, then that thing that's happening, that's, that's your culture. Yeah. I agree. And you gotta you have to pay attention to the reality of the situation yeah. because that's what your that's the new standard. That mm -hmm. that becomes the norm. Yep. And you have to eliminate it when you see it and it's yep. not your culture. And it's, it's hard so in those it's hard in those early days too, because like sometimes there's no answer right oh dude like no it's not two shakes it's three shakes where does it say that it doesn't say that anywhere <laughs> yeah now, we have to put yeah, it now yeah like we gotta yeah. okay like i and need those, to that's build a that good system point. like a lot of people i think they get overwhelmed by like building the, the their standards and all this stuff but a lot of it is just documenting the, the issues as they come up yes you don't have to have all the answers on day one yes. it's going to be impossible to identify everything right but when there is a debate 
then you you saw you you, know, you, you solve the the debate and then you document it and that's the new standard op- operating procedure. Absolutely. Whatever. Um, what about when when did you know? How long did it take you to go from one to two locations? Um, so the first one opened, basically it took us all of 2013 to get it open. You know, like I think I left in April of 2013, but we didn't open until like the last week of December. Right. And so like we went through all these challenges to get it open. So I always kind of say we opened in 2013, but really our life started in 2014. Okay. Um, and then the second one opened 2013. So again, dude, like those three years are the formative years. Wait, you opened, you started opening the first one in 2013. It opened in 2014 and the second one opened in 2013. 17. 17. You said 13 yeah. twice. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. you're good. So it took you three years Yeah. Uh, to, to, to get to that second location. How yeah. did you know you were ready? What was what was going on? Was it an cash opportunity flow. that you... Cash flow. Okay. You nice. know, cash flow, dude, ca- I don't know, like, anybody who gets into this business to lose money, right? And, and, you know, every... We were making money. We got to a point where we were, you know, getting into the cash flow, right? And so, so we were you, like... You said earlier that you needed to make 18000 a month. A month? It was like sixteen here. No, 16 a week. 16 a week. Right. To and cover so your like, expenses. Yeah. And so we started doing twenty four, twenty five, you know, $26,000 a week. And so we're comping double digit, you know, 25% up this week, 25% up this week. So we're like, you know, like when you, when you look at a business cycle, you look at it in a few phases, right? So you say, okay what is this going to take to start it, right? Like that seed money, like the the proof of concept, right? And so that's typically, you know, between 200 and a half million dollars, something like that. And then you're like, okay, cool. Like now let's go to the second phase of like, you know, a little bit more development, right? And so like, let's develop this thing. So let's put another million dollars into it, right? And so that's what we did. That was the second phase. So we opened deals number two in 2017, deals number three in 2018, and then we were on track to open deals number four in 2019. So you didn't get financing to open a second location. You got financing to open the next three locations. No, no, no. Uh, no. Okay. Like we, we had to we had to make cash flow at D2, but then we quickly turned that cash flow and those P&Ls into a new loan. So like in terms of the growth, we're all bank traditional financing. Gotcha. All based on cash flows, right? Like because that's the way to grow, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like don't grow something like if, if number one and number two aren't making money. Don't as much as you can don't rob peter to pay paul fix peter for walls paul. economics man yeah man like yeah. fix it first right yeah. like and so you look at like same restaurant sales is like a good indicator of like kind of like okay like are we one percent up two yeah. percent up five whatever like okay like that's giving us some confidence and like i think that's exactly what i mean when i say don't put the energy out put the energy in i think mm-hmm. when people think about scaling they're like we need to go out we need mm-hmm. to buy a new location new facilities but instead of putting that that money out, put put that money into making sure the ones you got mm-hmm. are as good as possible, yeah. and that they can generate the cash flow you need yeah. for the next opportunity. And, and I think that that is like at the essence of Four Walls Economics, right yeah. there. Yeah, and um, it's people or product. You yeah. know what I mean? Like those are the only two issues. You know what I mean? Like, well, why aren't you growing sales? I don't know. Well, it's either people or product. Yeah. Pick. I mean, figure it out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you have ten restaurants. Eight of them are comping sales, 1%, 5%, whatever, but this one's not. Okay, well, is it the people or the product? You know, like, very simple. Yeah. So what are your biggest failures been in the past, like, three years since scaling from two to, to four locations? Uh, I think that it's it goes at people again. You know what I mean? Like, so when we opened the second restaurant, um, you know, a, a big mistake that I made was not staying true to my focus on what a lot of people, 50% of our customers come through our drive through Okay. I opened Frisco without a drive through Yeah. So like, that's a, that's a problem that's still plaguing me, right? Like it's, it's much more difficult to make money at that restaurant than it is to make in my restaurant in Plano, my restaurant in McKinney, the one in Denton that we're opening has a in-cap drive through right? So like, that's a mistake I won't make again because I, un- I understand my brand better now. I-, I had this like vanity back then of like, Man, I can like make anything into gold, right? <laughs> and like not only that, man, but like um, our product. Like I was like, man, our 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 product's not fast food. It's fast casual. It's so high quality. We make everything fresh. We make our own sauces. Like all this stuff. And so like I was like, we don't need a drive through. But like and then I realized, like man, people love the fact that it is that high quality, but they can get it on the road or yeah. they can get it conveniently. Like they want that quality quick service, right? Yeah. That's the niche that we were filling. And then I went back into being in the bloody waters of fast casual. I'm like, damn it. What the <laughs> hell did I just do? You know? So that was a huge mistake. So I think the lesson is knowing your identity, knowing your, your, your model. Yeah, right? and, absolutely. But you don't know until you know. So sometimes I think it takes a failure yeah. to highlight 
your identity, to yeah. highlight where you shine. Absolutely. Uh, so I wouldn't fault you. I mean, sometimes those those weaknesses can be the strengths. Yeah. Right? They help you. So I agree, but when you have to write the payroll check, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> what else? Any other uh, hiccups along the way? Lessons you learned the hard way that you can you know, give our, our listeners a heads up on. I also, during that time, took my eye off the ops ball, right? Like I was, I thought, oh, I'm a multi-unit operator. Now I don't need to be in the restaurants as often. No, like that's not how it, it works. You know what I mean? Like, so there was a year there probably in like 2018 where I'm like, okay, both I've got two restaurants that are making money. I don't need to check in as much. Like I'll get like a kind of a district dude, you know, to like do that for me. Um, you know, I'm busy opening this other one. Like I'm all about scale now. You know what I mean? Like I, I started like doing that stuff and it got me distracted and it, and it really hurt my unit in Frisco because I had the wrong operator in there and I, and I didn't see the, uh, same restaurant sales de- declining fast enough to pivot quick enough to get them replaced fast enough to like salvage the ship. And, and so like, Instead of that being maybe like a one month, like, hey, customers who came during this period, sorry, like, you know, we got it fixed, like, you know, yeah. whatever. Like, it, it was kind of like, that was like a six month turnaround. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to recover um, from distrust. Yes. Right? Yes. It, 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 people are, aren't very forgiving. Right. Uh, so you said you, you, you weren't paying attention to the same source sales. Mm-hmm. So you're meaning month over month or well, not week just the same, week or? Not, not necessarily just like the same restaurant sales maybe, but like just the kind of general malaise in the unit. Like, I think that the vibe died a little bit, you know, and like, instead of like just jumping on it and being like, why is it a little bit dirtier here than it was two months ago? Why is it a little bit quieter? Why isn't, you know what I mean? And I wouldn't stay. Maybe you were distracted by all the other things going on. Yeah, other things going on. Kind of drifted from you. Trying to open another restaurant, like doing whatever I was doing, you know what I mean? And like, I I think that like, that's the other thing is, is like continuing to develop systems for for units i didn't have yet you know what i mean like dude like what do you what we don't need that you know what i mean like you're you're wasting your time developing things that are for a 10 unit chain we've only got two and the the second one is like having a hard time right now and like i would do the seagull visits like i would come in i would crap on everything (laughs) i'd get the hell out of there you know what i mean like so like Uh, that was that was a like a bad thing to do don't be a a seagull visitor. don't be a seagull visitor like stick around what did you start doing differently uh, once you've experienced that that you you know you you gotta inject yourself a little bit more into the ops. Yeah. How did you change your your schedule? How did you change your routine to to make sure you weren't taking your eye off the ops and the culture in each location? I completely changed my mind in terms of the people I was willing to tolerate. In terms of like you know you get what you demand, you encourage what you tolerate, right? And so I was like, man, I'm gonna demand better performance out of my general managers, and I'm gonna pay what it takes in this. Like I was paying, I was underpaying, so I was getting underperformance you know what i mean like i was getting like service manager i was getting i was paying service manager pay and i was getting that level of performance yeah. right and so like it wasn't sharp it wasn't as organized as it should be etc 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 and i was like dude like i'm gonna i'm gonna pay to get an a player yeah. in here and then l- let's see what they can yeah. do because i'm i'm willing to pour into them but i hate coming here and visiting this person that isn't doing a good job but and it's a money thing, man. Like it, it's hard to like really d- super dive deep into that because there's so many external factors that go into it. Maybe another day, man. Cause I'm loving this conversation. You're giving yeah. us gold. If you ever want to do a deep dive into that topic, yeah. I'm down. Um, and I'm only down the street three hours down the nice. street, but I'll come back up to make another uh, conversation happen. All right. Um, so what about the future? What's the future look like? I mean, what's your, your plan for scale? Like, yeah. You know, you mentioned you have one place in Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really super familiar with all the, the towns you're mentioning. Yeah. But like, what, what's the radius we're looking at with like the, your Louisiana is three hours away, right? Yeah. So Shreveport is where we have a, a joint venture partner. Um, a guy I worked with for a long time, like again, kind of another story, but they're yeah. going to open 10 restaurants in Louisiana. Where did you work with them? Raising Cane's. Okay. Yeah. So it's some, not some schmuck. No. It's some dude that his name is Pete John. So dude. you recruited him. Basically. Oh yeah. Operator like dude's, dude's a killer. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, and so like awesome guy. Um, so partners with him and he's like an operator and marketing dude. You know what I mean? Like, perfect guy to run Louisiana. Um, so that's them out there. Like I'm, we're in a different phase right now. So like we, we got the proof of concept, right. And then we kind of went through the development phase. And right now we're looking for like a, a, a cash injection for launch phase, right? Okay. Launch phase is what you do to when you inject like $4 million. Okay. Right. Okay. And then you go from launch and then you go to scale. 
right? Or, or kind of like that development slash scale. So where it's like, so you're in launch phase now. Yeah, we're, what, what well, that's that what we're like? looking to do. Okay. So like $4 million for us would be eight to 10 new units, right? And so like, we're looking to say, okay, we've made it this far, we've got this success proven, right? And now we need to launch into being a bigger brand, right? And so like, opening more locations, right? Taking care of business, but like, dude, my vision for this is to be the brand for Primo Quesadilla Meals, period. That's yeah. the vision. You know, like think how big that vision is. And so, so how do you hope to scale what you've created? Primo, quality, culture, all yeah. these variables. Um, how, how do you expect to hang on to that level of intensity as you scale? What's your plan for that? I, I think a lot of your listeners probably know this, but the key to Primo operations is general managers. They're the lifeblood. They are a, a person sent from heaven. Like they drive the culture. They drive the systems. They drive the consistency. They drive the accuracy. 100% of our success, 100% of our revenue, 100% of our profitability is, given, is the general managers. We're absolutely a servant leadership company. I work every day to serve my general managers, genuinely. Yeah. Right? And what and, happens when you do that? Um, did like they feel developed, they perform, you know, like that they, they feel supported and, and that they own their business. You know what I mean? Like we, we give a, a good percentage of our EBITDA back, you know, so they have a ownership stake in their, in their unit, even though they don't need to put any money into it. Right. And, and on top of that, they make a great salary. So like they're motivated to drive the performance of the restaurant, you know, and they're just the right people. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, 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 like you don't go out and just, you, you just got to find the yeah. right ones, you know? So, so you're talking a lot. We're still in the launching phase right, mm -hmm. of this. And you're saying one of the big things you got to do is focus on the general managers because you yeah. need to keep that culture strong. Yeah. What about where site selection? What about how, what are you thinking? What are you considering? What, what's going through your filter when you're deciding to, to put a, a Dilla's in a certain location? Um, you know, you, you do look at the demographics. You know, I think that like we also like like to look over in the other lane a little bit in terms of like other restaurants that are similar to us. You know what I mean? Like because... We like going places where the other volumes are extremely high because you can see that there's a demand that still needs to, that can still be diluted, right? Yeah, so you can cannibalize a little bit. Yeah, yeah. you know, like you, you want to go into it where the Chick-fil-A is doing $8 million and not four, right? And like, and because that, that might be, it may be still underserved, right? And so like, and for us, like those are the types of locations that we want to be in. We want to be in places where the community is going to appreciate our opening, right? Like, because when we come to town, we're going to develop their young kids better than another company would, right? Like we're going to give back to their community better than another company yep. would, but we want to be appreciated for that a little bit. You know what I mean? Like we want a, a busy opening. Like we want to go to those communities that are like, man, like this is cool that they're coming here. They yeah. chose us, yeah. you know, and like for a reason, because they think this is a really cool place to be, you know, like I don't want to go someplace where it's just like the, the community like isn't, it maybe not necessarily behind it, but there's so much noise that they're like, Oh cool. Like whatever, yeah. you know, like that's important to me. So Kyle, is there anything we haven't touched on any knowledge that you think is inside of you that needs to get out, that needs to, to be shared with the rest of the industry? Now's the time to get it out. Yeah. Um, man, I don't know. Like, I think that like, it's a tough business, you know, like I encourage people to go for it. Right. But like, try to stay focused on like the important things, what you know what I mean? Things? Like the people, yeah. you know, like it's so, so, so important. And like, it's also a business, man. Like I, I think a lot of people get into this for like maybe the wrong reasons and forget that this is a business. People have to get paid. People's lives are depending on it. And they like, you know, like you get a certain responsibility to the people that yeah. come to work for you. To, to, right. To everybody wants security. to, everybody wants to save the world until payrolls do, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, like, so like, you know, stand behind things that you can actually do. Like don't, don't try to bite off the entire apple. You know what I mean? Like just make a small donation to the, the church or like, yeah. it doesn't have to be, we're going to give away 90% of our profits to, you know, build churches around the world. Like, yeah, if you can, great. But like, dude, you, restaurant yeah. margins are tight as let, it is. Let them use your space to come in for their weekly meeting or exactly. whatever it is. Like you have other assets. Yes. You know? Build community. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't have to be this like, or, you know, we're going to change the world with our profits or whatever. Like it can be just 
truthful and honest to we're going to provide Do great what you can. yeah we're going to provide a great opportunity in a great place safe place for yeah. kids and, and one thing that helps else. is if you budget that into your your model early on maybe yeah. it's five percent or two percent or whatever it is yeah goes to our cause but like that two percent in the early days isn't that much yeah but when you get to that tenth location you know you can make a big impact on your community absolutely yeah um awesome stuff man i've loved this conversation one thing i've been asking all my guests the mission statement is to inspire empower and transform the restaurant industry as we know it so how have you transformed who are you today versus the man you were when you're 23 years old wet behind the ears Mm -hmm. uh itching to open your dillas yeah i think i'm just genuinely happier for people you know what i mean like i I think that i early on had had blame you know what i mean like uh, i would try to hold on to people you know like for my own personal good yeah you know when it's time to go on you're like well what about me yeah what about me like what do you mean why are you quitting what was you know like cheating on me yeah Yeah. like so (laughs) i've gotten over that you know what i mean i just want people to be genuinely happy and like I, i want them to understand that like at the end of the day like Dillas and we're going to do everything that we can for you. But like, if this doesn't align with your goal and your vision for your life, leave. Yeah. It's funny. Cause one of the things I, I say is like, it should be your goal to push people out of your restaurant. Yeah. Like you should be, in the back of your head thinking what can i give you how can i set you up for success how can i put you on a uh, on a direct uh trajectory yeah. to get you out of my restaurant as fast as possible and when you have that approach they never leave right <laughs> it's crazy you know what i mean because, but like you got to learn yeah, that yeah you and know, it's tough you it's know funny. like it's I, counterintuitive I think that, right and so like i you know we had a situation where a, a, a young lady quit on my gm pretty quick been around for four years right and he's like mad and upset and she owes me and like all this stuff and i had to like really walk owes him you what uh, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, man, like think about how much she gave us. That's you know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know? Like we're, we're so thankful for the time that she put in, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're net positive mm. in this situation. You know what I mean? Then like, I, I would be thinking more about like, Hey, like, thank you so much for all of your years of, of so, yeah, we so much yeah. appreciate it. And so like kind of teaching him that lesson, you know, of like, man, like if you can learn to let go and go through those he was going through grief. You, you know what I mean? Like he was in denial. He was, you know, that upset. They're gone the day that you hire them. Yes. You know? Yeah. And, and help them on that fast track. That's it. Um, and it's amazing how that mental flip. Yeah. Just have, it will have a huge impact on your business. I yeah. love this conversation. One more quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to bust out a speed round. This episode brought to you by margin edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Oh, man, that one's tough. Um, I'm a great listener. Um, I have a genuine heart. Uh, That is what is, I think, that is my it factor, you know? Um, And, man, I bring the E, you know what I mean? Like, I I got enthusiasm and energy, man. Like, like, that stuff is contagious. Yes, it is. And, like, you got to bring it or... You know, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, check out Contagious Culture if you don't think that, like that. that E brings it. Uh, that's a book by uh, Anise Kavanaugh. I'll okay. link to it in the show notes. Okay. Uh, what is your biggest weakness? Biggest weakness is probably procrastination. Not, you know, not doing stuff that I probably, it needs to get done. But I'm like, oh, I'll wait till we have enough money to hire somebody for that. You know what I mean? Like, because it literally drains my life force yeah, I feel on that. some things. Uh, what is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're building your team? Man, eye contact, you know, eye contact, genuine smile. You know what I mean? Like, dude, those are lessons learned from Chick-fil-A. You know what I mean? Like the hire the hire the right people. Don't train them to be the right people. Yeah, I love it, man. Uh, what is one question? Oh, just ask that one. What is one current challenge you're dealing with and how are you overcoming it? Um, I think the biggest challenge right now is definitely absolutely people, you know what I mean? In terms of like it being really tight, you know what I mean? So, um, I'm happy to pay more, you know, like, I don't know, three, four years ago, we were probably paying eight fifty to $9 on average. Now we're paying $11 on average. And that's a short amount of time to just yeah. add that amount of labor expense. We you learned know? the hard way. We talked about it earlier. You know, yeah. Just a little extra. It goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that like, it's just, um, 
it, it's a tight labor market. Um, so that's like the biggest challenge is figuring out how we can make sure that we add on those other kind of soft skills, you know, um, that like the development, them having a best friend at work, like all that, like we give them a flexible free case schedule. of DF, flexible schedules. Yeah. That's like, a big one right there. Yeah, the there's the a day, lot of like, stuff. Nobody's going to want to show up to your restaurant as bad as you do. Or right. As, as, they're not as willing to show up to your restaurant as, as, as much as you are. And get over that because yeah. they have other more important things in their life. Absolutely. You're, like your restaurant is not the most important thing in their life, no. especially if they're in high school or Absolutely. college. Yep. So accept it early on because it will make your life a lot better. Totally. Uh, share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. This is a way to be, a way to act, core value. Oh, man, professionalism. You know what I mean? Integrity. Like, those are, like, big for me, especially in this, like, in the restaurant. What is res- what is professionalism? Professionalism, man, like, shake hands, make eye contact. You know, like, those things are, like, they got to be trained. And I, uh, people listening to this who have teams, they've got somebody that they're thinking about in their head right now who's, like, man, like, if I could just teach that guy, that gal professionalism, she could be a CEO of a company. You I'm know what I mean? Like, because yeah. the work ethic is amazing, the enthusiasm is amazing, but they're not quite professional. When I feel when I, when I hear professionalism, I, I, feel, I think respect. Yeah, you know, just respect. Yeah. you know, just appreciate. It. It's a, it's the golden rule. Yeah, you know, that's that's what I think of. When and I hear and language. Yeah, you know what I mean. I'm pretty bad about that. I'm not gonna lie. You know, mature <laughs> maturity. You know what I mean? Like, there's some yeah. things in there. Like, you can have fun in the lines. Yeah, you know, um, and then like. Man, like, honestly, like, a lot of people also, like, don't understand at Dilla's, like, you don't have to be yourself. Yeah. Like, when you're here, be the superhero, like, in your in your mind. Like, be over the top. Bring more energy. Like, you don't you don't have to be kind of like your introverted, you know, like, I you know, like, whatever. You can be whoever you want to be. You have, like, this avatar at work yeah. that, like, can just be, like, this superhero. Like, I, <laughs> I play it all the time. It's fun. I like it. Uh, what is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So this is something that's common within the four walls of your businesses, mm-hmm. but not common throughout the industry. Oh, man. Way to go above and beyond. That one's tough, man. I think it comes down to details. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, is the top of that, uh, you know, window ledge dusty or not? You know what I mean? Like, teaching that and, and like... I think customers notice those details. Like I was teaching, um, I was coaching somebody today on wiping out the, I saw the whole ketchup gasket or whatever. You know I what I mean? Sitting, I was parked right over there. Yeah. Getting yeah. ready for this interview. Yeah, and so I was like, I oh, look at him going through the training that guy. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. was like, I like this. Yeah. Guy. So I was like, man, like the detail of like making sure that there's not ketchup drips in the ketchup gasket. Like, you know, like we want to set the bar, raise the bar for like what, service can look like but like man like other Make, than like making eye sure the dumpster or the cage around yeah. the dumpster is closed right you know yeah, like it's it's, it's yeah <laughs> like it's those details yeah. and like man like it's hard to like really be like trust me it matters it you know does. what i mean it's, like subconscious i don't think the the your customers know yeah. that it matters yeah it's subconscious it's little yeah. things that just compound yeah and, but when you pay attention to those little things it's so valuable absolutely um okay the next question I have for you is what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant operator? Dude, I'm really into the untethered soul right now. Um, Michael A. Singer, um, the untethered soul. And he, he's got another one. I think that's the, uh, follow up book. It's, uh, the, uh, oh man, I'm forgetting it. Um, but if you look up Michael A. Singer, it's really good. And man, it's, it's really just about kind of that unconditional happiness. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, He's very meta, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm just I'll like, check it out. I'm really into it, you know what I mean? Because it, it's there's a there's a quote in the book that's like, if you're going into a situation, if you're about to walk into an important meeting, whatever, like just remember perspective. You're you're a tiny speck on a little blue dot spinning in the middle of nowhere. Just think about that, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it changes everything. Yeah, yeah. dude. Like, it, be unconditionally happy. I love it. What is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? Hmm. Uh, one-on-ones and, and, uh, operational audits, right? Like operational audits for me aren't fun, right? But I'm the district manager. I've got the four units and like, I need to go in and do the operational audits to make sure that things are getting done properly, that the food quality is right, that, that, that we're delivering the goods, you know what I mean? And like that gets missed, I think, because it's a, it's a checkbook checklist kind of like, oh man, I'm, I'm above that. But like, I still come in, I do cleaning audits quarterly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just to make their sure things are staying sharp. Um, because, uh, it, do you do it the same time in the quarter or do you do it randomly within a quarter? Yeah. Randomly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'll usually like, I have an admin day for myself and I'll schedule those audits out. You know what I mean? And like, 
I don't typically do surprise ones because it's about an hour and a half audit. You know what I mean? Like I want the GM to be there. Like I want them to, you know, make sure that it's clean. But again, like I'll look the night before and be like, dude, like, did you spend 30 hours of, of team labor last night? You know what I mean? Like, dude, like I'll see that, you know, like keep it clean, but like, let's do like a really deep dive, make sure that it's immaculate once a quarter. I love it. Okay. This is not, I thought it was the last question. We've got a couple more. Uh, Name one service that you've hired uh, like a person, like a, not necessarily a technology, but like Mm -hmm. an expert. Yeah. Um, Nick Omwet at a bird dog supply outsource supply chain. Dude, I mean, huge. I mean, this is like a game changer for us. Probably seventy to one hundred twenty thousand dollars in additional revenue because of outsourced purchasing professional. You know what I mean? Like somebody to come in and be like, "You're paying too much for your groceries." Okay. And like, dude, so like know we as restaurants, is, right? Yeah, and, and like they'll look at look at the contracts and look at your you know distribution margin and stuff like that. I'm telling you, man, restaurateurs like. Dude, we That's don't. That's a specialist. Yeah, right we don't take out the name that one more time. Bird dog. Bird dog supply chain. Bird dog yeah. supply chain. Yeah. And the name of the person. Nick Omwet. Look out, Nick. You're gonna be getting some, <laughs> some business. Um, the next question I have for you is, what is tech, one technology you've adopted within your four walls? So this is like yeah. a maybe a labor management tool, a POS, or yeah. any other technology that you've been leveraging to improve communication, profitability, anything along those lines. Like yeah. Efficiency. I like order mark. It, it is like a, it kind of like brings in all of the, uh, like a uh, third party online ordering into like a single source tablet. Okay. Um, I think that that level of integration is something that is tough for like onesie twosie. Yeah. Lines of communication between you and your providers. Yeah, man. Cause providers. we can't, we can't afford, um, all the, all the integrations. Toast is doing a really good job about that for smaller concepts, but like if they're on like a legacy, you know, thing, a lot of people won't integrate for you until you're at 10 or 15 units. Yeah. So like we always like, we're on the lag end, you yeah. know what I mean? Like as some of these smaller groups, um, because it's just not worth it to some of these tech companies to like build us something or give so us an app yeah. or whatever. So you're using uh, toast. Why toast? We're not using toast. No, so using like, it. no, we're using Oracle, um, okay. which is like their symphony platform. The reason we use that is because it was cloud-based and like, we've been on that for three years and cloud-based three years ago for a POS was cutting edge. Yeah. Right. Um, the integrations though are difficult. So like that would be a reason why we would go away from them is like, we need to be integrated into some of these third-party things. Go away from things. Oracle or go away from Toast? Oracle. Okay. Yeah. Toast is one of the ones that we really like. Okay. You know, like, uh, I think that they're doing it right. It's very simple. Like, they integrate to a lot of things, make it easy on the operator. Like, and they're looking ahead to what's going to be a big thing, which is, like, we need to be able to bring that Uber Eats order directly into the point of sale and yep. not have it, oh, on this tablet, and then I got to print that, and then that hurts my accuracy. Yep. You know, it wastes time, like efficiency. So it's going to be the big thing. Like we And we work with like Hot Schedules and Skooks is like an online uh, training School. platform yep. uh, for videos, you yep. know, stuff like that. I read on your actual Facebook this thing called Jolt, and I had oh, a call yeah. with them last week. Dude. Did you mention Restaurant Unstoppable? I didn't. I didn't. I should, though. You definitely should. Yeah, but Jolt, dude, they got their stuff together, man. Yeah. Like, anybody who hasn't looked at them Power yet, like, should set up a call. You put a checklist on a tablet, magic yeah. happens. Yeah. Uh, and that's a reminder, anybody listening to this, you guys have no idea. And it's something I need to be better about. It's like, as you guys need to train your employees to do the right thing, I need to train you. My listeners are basically not my employees, but you're my team. You're my yeah. people. And uh, when you hear about a tool or service on the show that comes out comes up, comes up a lot, just drop my name yeah let them know that eric cacciatore sent you that you have no idea how much that supports the show awesome and if, I, and if i'm being frank i need the help so <laughs> give me some, give me some support Let's uh, do it. and this is the last question right here if you got the news you'd be leaving this world tomorrow all the memories of you your work and your restaurants would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy what would those three pieces of wisdom be be unconditionally happy uh love them where they are I think that's a that's one that's a thinker for you. Love them yeah. where they are, um, and then um, man, I think that invest your time. Don't waste it. 
you know like i think way time too is many. your most invaluable oh, asset God, and dude it's, it's the one equalizer it's the one thing no matter who you are or what your privilege is we have the same amount of it yes so it can be your it can be your your slight edge if you but use it wisely i'm you know? so pro- i'm so surprised though how few people invest their time right you know what i mean like they invest their money they you know whatever but like the concept of investing their time and not wasting it in front of something that's stupid and completely pointless like uh, you know it could be a tv show and i get people like to decompress i do too but yeah. like find time to invest the time block out time for tv show it's yeah. the last thing you do before you go to bed you know right. what i mean like the, that, that's when you watch your show that's what i do yeah so that's what i do when i'm i'm laying in bed and about to go to sleep i'll yeah. watch my show yeah uh, it's a good way to kind of calm down but i love it man this has been a great conversation uh thank you so much for taking the time to share your story your knowledge your mentorship we wrap up every chat by calling somebody out that's how i found you although i did find you before that <laughs> but this is when you're really on my radar. So uh, l- let me know who do you respect and admire and think should be a good guest on the show. Man, there's a guy. Um, I-, I don't know all the people you've had on your show, but Clay Island is a guy who you should know. He's a really awesome dude. He's got a coffee shop and like roasts his own beans. Nice. And like he's just like, and where's he? God, he- he's in Richardson, Texas. Okay. Um, but man, like he is this like such a local dude, culture guy, like. I don't know, man. Like, I really respect him. Um, he was in a, an EO uh, accelerator with me, you know, like that kind of helps you work on your business. What's EO for those who aren't familiar so with it? So, EO is Entrepreneur's Organization. Yeah, and you're in um, there with Terry, too, right? That's how yes, you guys seem close. It, man, for people who need help building their business, like, it's, it's kind of built around a book called Scaling Up. It's um, a great book, by the way. Oh, man. And, like, it's, it was, it, it didn't, I don't know if it saved my business, but it, definitely helped me put in the operating system that i needed to run my business I love it, man. right and i mean yeah clay islands he's awesome clay look out i'm coming after you and how can we connect with you uh, if we listen to today to today's episode we're young driven uh looking to maybe open our own place someday we want to come learn from somebody who took the same path yeah you did like what what's what's the best way to connect email me like kyle gordon at dillas.com text me 214-577-7147. Text me, man. Beautiful. Like, let me know. <laughs> I don't care. I'm an open book, man. Like, I'll help you any way I can. And I'm not sure what episode number this is going to be, but make sure you stick around uh, for the closing thoughts. I'll be sure to share the episode number with you guys so you can uh, find everything we talked about today. There will be a summary of today's discussion, a link to any tool, book, or resource recommended, and uh, how to connect with Kyle over there. Again, Kyle Gordon, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. For taking the time to share your story your knowledge, your mentorship. There's no questioning, my friend. You are unstoppable. Cheers.